Greetings, everyone. I'd like to welcome you to our new Shark Academy December call. We're very much looking forward to being together today and we have the opportunity to introduce Geometrica. Um, last month when we met, we spoke mostly about reflections about Arithmetica. And so we're going to begin, as we always do, with an invocation from Apila. For those of you who have their screens on, I've lit the labyrinth candle from Chartres to begin our conversation leading up to Chartres 2018 Geometrica. I'm lighting this cedar from the fire of the labyrinth. Ancestors, spirits of our beloved Hill of Chartres, Cathedral of Chartres, Veil of Mary, Labyrinth, Crypt. We think of you now from our homes and our places so far removed, or so it seems. Yet in our hearts, return to that fire that opens the ceremonies. The sound of the voice of the morning conversations, the images and the music of dream work, the flickering candlelight of walking the labyrinth, the summations, the conversations, the inspirations, the tears, the challenges, the memories, the renewals, the opening, emerging strong on our path, sure of our footsteps. In this way, we approach Geometrica through all the shapes that hold, contain, and move the energy and the prescription of Arithmetica for this possibility to participate in the creation story of life. We give thanks. Thank you, Apila. It's wonderful to see you and be with you, even though it's um, cyberspace. <laughs> I feel your heart and uh, wonderful. Yeah. So <clears throat> just to give a short overview of our, our um, well, before, before I do that, actually, Kaylin has written a poem that um, was inspired by walking the labyrinth in his home in Maine. And he's going to share that with us now as uh, an inspiration before we continue on our call. Nightfall among pines, a full moon dusted with stars. Gone without a trace, time flows on through boundless space. Cold pines are singing. Winter woods, music enough. First chill of winter with wind-driven clouds above. Clear sky seems empty. Heaven's music now endless. Winds sing through forest while wild geese write as they fly. Chanting a sutra, I bow in deep reverence. Thoughts scatter in mist. Wisdom and enlightenment shine beyond knowing. Thank you, Kaylin. It's beautiful. Thank you. And it's not snowing here in Chapel Hill, but there was a report that it might snow tomorrow, but I don't think it will. But I'm thinking of you there in the snow, the beautiful first snows of the year where it's so pristine. Yeah. So thank you for sharing your poem with us. And <clears throat> our um, call today the main focus of it is to give some initial introductory sort of seed thoughts about sacred geometry. And um, I will be giving um, a short sharing about some thoughts that I have about Geometrica and Jim will be giving some of his thoughts about it. 
he may also be talking about Zarathustra, which happens to be something he plans to focus on when we all gather in Chartres in July. And um, so that's, that's the overview of our call today. And then we'll have time for comments and questions from those who are with us. And I just like to say a few words before um, Jim has a chance to give us sort of an update on how things, things are going. Um, just that in these times right now where there's so much um, happening that is very challenging for the environment, for human hearts, for communities of people, for our nation, divided as it is in those of us who live in the United States. Um, we are living under conditions where we could say the laws of the universe or the teachings that Pythagoras brought through about sacred geometry are not being upheld by humanity. And we are seeking to find our way through all of this and to bring order and um, let's just say alignment with what the um, gifts of nature are giving us unconditionally, um, but we aren't responding to them in that same way. So to bring the truth and alignment back to our relationship with nature and our relationship with one another and our relationship with the spiritual world and to think about how sacred geometry plays into that. Um, last year we studied sacred number and we came to an understanding of how numbers are the sort of archetypal principles, one, one after the next of existence and the way that they then will manifest into form is what we're going to be talking about. And we're very much looking forward to um, Jane returning. He's very excited about that and he has quite a bit to say about sacred geometry. And those of us who were gathered last summer and were able to experience his enthusiasm and brilliancy and joy and um, mastery with, with number and form um, are really excited and looking forward to being with him again. And we're also going to be joined by Robert Lawler, who is an extraordinary man who has done very significant work in the field of an advancement of the understanding of geometry and its layered relationship to cosmic um, ideals that Plato brought through and Pythagoras brought through, and also has done a tremendous amount of work with the Aborigine people in Australia and has lived amongst them for many years, I think 20 years or more, and has written um, pretty much um, the, um, I, I can't think of the word I want, but a, a, the book that really um, expresses the sort of primal and um, eternal essence of their culture and the wisdom that they carry, much of which has been lost in our industrialized world. And so he also brings a perspective on the indigenous people of Australia, which is quite profound. So looking forward very much to having Robert Lawler with us. He is living in Australia. And so for him, it's about 4 a.m. right now. So that's why he isn't with us on these calls, but he will be our featured speaker coming in um, either in January or February, we're hoping. And at that time, we're going to reschedule the timing of our call so that it's at a humane hour for him 
and we'll be keeping you posted about that. But you can expect that one of our calls will be at a different time in order to accommodate um, his life circumstances there in Australia. So that's a little update. And um, I'd like to invite Jim to say a few words um, about how he's doing and how things are going with the Wisdom School of Graduate Studies. And, um, and then we'll launch into our um, talk about Geometrica. So Jim. Hello everyone. Thank you, Karen. Uh, and thank you for the poem, uh, Kaylin. And as usual, Apila, for your invocation. It's always so beautiful to um, hear the sound of your voice. It always takes me immediately to the Saint Charles room and, and the, the atmospherics of, uh, of Chartres there. And so thank you. Um, I think the, the major thing that I'd like to report is that the, the syllabus and the logistics page for uh, Chartres are now up. So if you go to the Wisdom School website, uh, they'll be up and, and available for registration. Uh, I would also add that we're going to be having our post Chartres uh, pilgrimage uh, with Andrew Harvey in mystical Paris. And uh, we had uh, that opportunity, I think four or five years ago with, with Andrew. And uh, those of you who were on that uh, pilgrimage know that it was one of those extraordinary moments. Uh, uh, so as you're thinking about uh, the first half of July next year in relationship to coming to Chartres, uh, think about joining us afterwards in, in mystical Paris. It's a, it's a unique and wonderful, wonderful uh, opportunity to uh, follow the Pied Piper um, through the labyrinthian walkways of ancient Paris and the feminine uh, aspects uh, with a man who deeply knows Paris, uh, deeply loves Paris, and whose mystical journey has been um, inextricably linked uh, with Paris. And um, uh, so I think that's the, 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 the main news that I would bring to bear. The um, uh, Ubiquity University has been uh, navigating through various challenges, um, but we are um, getting very close, as I think I indicated last time, uh, to finalizing our um, literally revolutionary new learning system that we're going to be bringing into the global market next year. Uh, I won't take the time to describe it right now, but I do want to flag it because I'm going to take a whole session uh, in Chartres uh, next July to really lay out what this university uh, is bringing into the global market. It, um, it is, um, it's gonna change education as we know it. And um, we're just finalizing the, the, um, the last few details and um, uh, meeting with a lot of uh, obstacles and travails along the way. Uh, but it's really an extraordinary thing how how uh, uh, resilient this team is and uh, how uh, dedicated everybody is to the success of our, our mission. So I want to thank Bob and Pila and Kaylin and Dan and various ones of you who um, uh, are on the core team and the staff for everything that you all have been doing as we uh, continue to to labor through increasingly turbulent uh, world um, uh, circumstances. And I would just say a final word, which sets the whole thing up for what we're gonna be doing in Chartres. If you think this year has been turbulent, what's coming 
is going to be even more extreme. And uh, I think we would could easily see, for example, the firing of Robert Mueller, the special uh, prosecutor. Uh, if you've been watching the news, uh, Donald Trump is setting in place all the uh, blocks uh, to do that. Uh, there's almost a hysteria coming out of Fox News uh, around the uh, termination of the special prosecutor's investigation. Uh, many of you probably noted uh, uh, Trump making the announcement yesterday um, about moving the, U the, uh, the U.S. recognizing uh, Jerusalem as the capital of Israel. Um, uh, that has everything to do with consolidating a domestic base so that when he makes whatever moves he's going to make, uh, his base is secure. And there's nothing like feeding the evangelical Christians the red meat of Jesus coming again. Uh, those of you who aren't familiar with the uh, Christian evangelicals, they believe that Jesus is coming again and that the the recognition of Israel's right to a capital in Jerusalem is one of the final pieces. So Trump just threw a huge part of his political base red meat. And uh, there is a, um, at the same time, uh, the special prosecutor is uh, closing in on him uh, for treason. Uh, and for money laundering, if you saw the news coming out over the last uh, couple of days with Deutsche Bank, uh, Deutsche Bank was the biggest bank involved with the Trump Organization, and it is, it is known uh, for many, many years to be a, a, a money laundering bank for the Russian oligarchs. So as we, as we think about all the turbulence that we've endured for 2017, we need to just get that 2018 is going to be 2017 on steroids. And we just need to psychologically, emotionally, spiritually ready ourselves for how we navigate that turbulence that's coming through the system that could include a war uh, in the Pacific with North Korea and now the probability of further conflagrations in the Middle East. What as we need to do as a mystical community is to ground ourselves in the eternal verities that underlie the turbulence. I mean, if you have, think of the image of, of sitting at the bottom of the ocean, most of us are at the top of the ocean, we're surfing the waves. But with the waves that are coming at us, it's going to do us uh, the world of good is if, if we can drop down underneath the surface and sit on the bottom for a while. That's where it's still. That's where it's quiet. That's where it's grounded. And if we don't have the capacity personally and collectively to ground ourselves into that which is eternal, that which is temporal and chaotic could well blow us away. Ubiquity is navigating that right now. There's nothing that I know of that is as radically new as Ubiquity University. Nothing I know is as radically new as what we're going to be bringing into the market next year. And because of that, we've been challenged to navigate some very, very uh, high waves. But we're sticking with it and we're persevering. Why? Because we're absolutely grounded in the vision of where we're going. And similarly with us 
in the Chartrian community. When you get to the quadrivium, as I'll say in my remarks after Karen, you're getting to the bedrock of reality itself. So as you think about coming to Chartres and what you're going to do next year, whether you come to Chartres or not, how you ground yourself existentially um, into the bedrock of your existence and the bedrock of reality itself is going to be more important than anything you do navigating the escalating chaos. And in fact, it is key to navigating that chaos. So I'll turn it over to uh, Karen now uh, for her remarks. Uh, but um, um, uh, by participating in this university and this wisdom school and in the Chartrian Academy, um, you're participating in something that's very much alive and is very much an attempt by a small group of people to build an island of coherence in the sea of chaos that we witness and participate in all around us. So thank you all for joining. Karen. Thank you, Jim. That was um, so clearly stated and um, so beautifully representative of what we're doing. So really, really appreciate how you were able to contextualize um, the importance of coming to the ground of our existence and the ground of the, of the meaning of the whole cosmos and, and how we're working with that in terms of the quadrivium, well, the whole of the seven liberal arts. So I, I just like to share a few um, seed thoughts that will offer some, some ideas for you to think about between now and when we come together in July. And one of them has to do with um, how sacred geometry, the consciousness of it, began in ancient Egypt. And what happened there, because of the way that the Nile floods, is people drew out their property lines and they had their, their crops that they grew and, and they had their boundaries, you know, like we have fences that define our yards. And, and they would grow their crops and each year the Nile would flood. And, and everything after it had been harvested would be washed away and all the boundaries would be erased with the water. And when the floods receded, they would reestablish boundary lines to various farmers' properties. And every year they were established, reestablished a little bit differently than they had been in, in the prior year. And what they were trying to do was create order in relationship to the earth and humanity's relationship to the earth. And they did this through creating these forms and ordering space. And then um, what would happen is that in, in realizing that they were um, working with these spatial forms, and that they varied year by year. They also had a relationship with the stars and they were watching the stars and they saw how the stars moved and changed. And they had an understanding that there was some relationship between the way that the stars were changing and how that influenced the way that they divided the borders of their parcels along the Nile River. And all of this was about coming into right relationship with the earth through form. And they called this geometry. That's what they called it. So this was the beginning of our understanding and working with the concept of geometry in, in ancient Egypt, which preceded the Greeks and preceded Pythagoras and Plato. And so in seeking to come into right relationship 
there were certain forms that evolved and those forms are the circle, the square, and the triangle. And those are the three most primary forms in geometry. And they are the basis that underlies the five platonic solids that, that Plato discovered. But these forms were understood in, um, the, in the minds of the Egyptians who were thinking about these ideas, that these forms were, were sacred, that they came from the cosmos, and that they would try to replicate them in their work on the earth in order that they were living a harmonious life, a life that was aligned with the cosmos, aligned with the gods. And, and so what we are going to be doing is trying to come to a greater understanding of these forms and, and what they really represent in terms of their cosmic um, origin. And one of the things that um, we could say is that they recognized that sound was behind the creation of form. And this was known by the ancients and it became um, known in the Western world, in, in um, our more modern world, through an Italian scientist whose last name was Cladney, and he did an experiment that um, revealed the Cladney plates. And so um, the second seed thought that I would like to share with you is that what he did was he took um, metal plates, you know, um, a square, rectangular, circular, triangular, um, pentagonal, octagonal, hexagonal. He took these metal plates and they were welded onto a post that had a base that was welded onto it. And then he could use a clamp to clamp the, the base of the, of the stem onto a table. So it was very secure. And, and he would stroke the side with a violin bow and he uh, made these at different pitches so that they were at different tones of the scale. And, and he would be working with this musically. And then he had the idea to sprinkle sand. You know, you can also use um, metal filings um, or, you know, salt and pepper or anything that's fine and granular. Um, and you sprinkle it all over the plate. And it's just, all, you know, covering the surface of the plate. And then when you take a violin bow and you start to strike stroke the edge of the plate, whichever shape it is, it starts to vibrate and create the tone of that whatever note it's pitched to. And as it starts to vibrate, all the little particles of sand or metal filings start to bounce around and they're jumping and jumping and jumping as the, the plate is vibrating. And then when you stop stroking the bow and the plate vibrates and then gradually it starts to settle down and the, all the little beads of sand, uh, grains of sand settle. There is an exquisite geometric form that emerges. I've had the pleasure of doing this in uh, sixth grade acoustics uh, class in, in the Waldorf schools. And if you have six different plates, 10 different plates, and they're all different shapes and different sizes so that the pitches are different, the forms that come out are completely different. And the ones we got, sometimes they were um, like a, a beautiful four-pointed star or a, a six-pointed star or a, a circle that had scalloped edges around it in uh, forming a, the basis of a hexagram or um, octagonal forms beautiful, beautiful forms. 
And so the geometry was actually emerging out of sound. And this is quite an astounding thing to realize that out of sound, form emerges. Creation arises out of sound. And this is part of, you know, in, in the um, Gospel of John, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, the prologue to John. The Word is sound. As there is sound, then form emerges. This is how creation comes about. And so this is a second thought I'd just like to share with you. Now, I also witnessed, and I, I've never really tried to find this. I haven't researched it. But I saw this probably 20 years ago in, uh, in a, on a video that was a big tank. It was like a huge fish tank. And it had um, different kinds of oils and water, different fluids in it that separated out. And each fluid had been tinted with a different color. So there was a red fluid and an orange fluid and a yellow fluid and green and blue and purple and magenta. They were all these different colors. And what happened was th this tank is there and these, one of them is heavier. And, and, and in terms of however heavy they are, they made a, a, they were stratified. And then they started playing a symphony, a recording of a symphony. I don't recall now which one it won. It, it could have been Beethoven's Ninth Symphony, but I, I'm not really sure what it was. And it, and it really doesn't matter. But as the sounds of the various instruments and the various pitches started to resound, the, the water started moving and the different tones were activated. The, the weight of the different fluids was activated by different pitches. And so the green would start to swirl and spiral in and, and you know, the yellow would come around and, and, and all these different shapes and these fluids would start to dance in relation to the various pitches. And so um, it was an amazing thing to watch. And it shows how substance responds to form. We know how our emotions, excuse me, respond to sound. We know how our emotions respond to music and to sound. But this is also how solids respond. It's also true, just as an aside, that um, a child, when they're in utero, the sounds that are going on around them are influencing the development of their organs and their form, the form of their being. And if they're in situations where they're exposed continually to sirens and jackhammers and um, trains rolling by and airplanes and all of that with you know, these really um, abrasive sounds, that's one thing. And if they're surrounded by glorious music or quiet, that's another influence that the, the tone has. And it's also true after children are born, and for all of us actually, but as the child is developing physically up until they're about 12 years old and their organs are forming, the sounds that they hear are influencing those, um, the development of those children. So that's something for us to think about that we'll be taking up in greater detail when we come together. And the last point that I wanted to make has to do with the platonic solids. So we'll be talking a lot about the platonic solids in July, and we will be um, constructing them so that you have a hands-on experience of making them and actually really building a relationship with them. We'll also be making large uh, models that you can go inside and feel what it's like to be inside each of these platonic solid forms. So Plato was the one who um, discovered or brought to consciousness that there are five forms that are possible in the world that um, adhere to certain rules. And that is that every um, 
saw, uh, length of an edge is exactly the same as all the other edges and that the shape of the sides of, you know, the, the face is the exact same shape as it would be all the way around the form. And I think probably all of you know um, and have seen the five platonic solids, but I'd just like to say a few things about them and um, stir up some thoughts for you to start considering until we get together and delve into this. Because what we're talking about here has to do with the foundation of creation. And when Jim talks about grounding ourselves in the essence of what is at the basis of reality, um, these geometric forms are very significant. And so um, the, the first form is the tetrahedron. It's four-sided. And each side is the shape of a triangle. And so there's a triangle flat on the bottom. I'm sorry, I'm not um, sophisticated at screen sharing, so I can't, but I think probably all of you know. So if there's a triangle as the base, and then from each of those sides, a triangle rises up. So there are four faces, three rising up to a point and one that's at the bottom. And so there are four faces, there are four points, and there are six edges in a tetrahedron. And it, um, the, the degree, the angle degree of all the angles on that is 60 degrees. So this is important to pay attention to these numbers. So, you know, 60 is one sixth of 360 degree circle. So, um, so we'll just leave the tetrahedron at that for a moment. Then we have an octahedron, which is um, a form that also is based on triangles. And there are eight faces instead of four. So um, there are four faces that point upward, that come around, and at the base of that is a square, but there isn't a face that's the shape of a square. And then there are four faces that four face downward. So you have four going up and four going down. And that um, is, is considered the octahedron because it has eight sides and it has eight faces six points and it has 12 edges then we have the hexa hexahedron so that's basically known as a cube so we all know that has six faces and it has eight points and it has 12 edges and um, that cube is very significant um, when it's very significant in the construction of of Chartres Cathedral, for example, and in all architecture, because you know when when you build something that has a dome, which is very common in Arabic architecture, and Chartres was very influenced by the Arabic architects. Um, it starts with a cube at the bottom, and then the dome is built over the cube. And if you want to turn it into a Gothic dome, you build that out of the cube and the original dome that then is um, adjusted, adapted into and raised, the center is raised up into a Gothic form. And that's what's used, the architects used at Chartres. So the cube is the, the basic primary form of the material world, you could say. The four, number four we spoke about last summer as the uh, square being to do with, with the earth or incarnating matter, the four seasons, the four directions, the four elements that, you know, it's the fourfoldness is when something is then brought into material existence. So we have the cube. And then we have um, the fourth platonic solid is the isosahedron. Now this, again, has triangles. Oh, uh, sorry, I want to go back. So I mentioned that the tetrahedron had 60 degree angles. The octahedron also has 60 degree angles. And we all know that the cube has 90 degree angles. Everything is based on, on the squares. So we have 90 degree angles at, at the, on all points. 
the isosahedron again has triangles and it has 20 faces. So there are 20 triangles with 12 points and 30 edges. And um, it again has 60 degree angles. So all the triangles, all the platonic solids that have triangle faces are based on a 60 degree angle because they have to be equilateral triangles and an equilateral triangle has 60 degree angles so that all three angles add up to 180 degrees, which if you don't remember that from studying geometry, you'll be reminded of it this summer. Okay, and then um, the fifth platonic solid, which is a very important solid for the Earth and for the cosmos and for the soul of the human being, is called the dodecahedron. Dodeca means 12. Deca is 10 and do is 2. So do deca is 2 plus 10 is 12. It's a 12 sided form. And the 12, as we know, relates to the cosmos, to the 12 constellations in the zodiac and uh, etc. And each of the faces of the dodecahedron is a pentagram, a five sided face. And the pentagram, we know the number five. Well, Ruth, Ruth is holding up the dodecahedron. There you can see it. So um, the five and the five-sided, we know from last summer, has to do with the human being. And, you know, we have Leonardo's picture of the human being with the arms out and the legs out and the head as the five points that we, you know, are um, in one sense a five-pointed star. And so this symbol has to do with the human being, with the fivefold nature, and the cosmos with the twelvefold nature, and the integration of the human being with the cosmos in the dodecahedron. Now, all of that, and, and the angle that of the, each um, corner of each pentagram is 108 degrees this very sacred number that our friend Jane, who's given his, made his last name 108, and will say quite a bit more about the significance of that number, and he did say some about it last summer. Um, so this angle of 108 is a profound number that is supporting this dodecahedron. Just as an aside, Rudolf Steiner spoke about the dodecahedron being very significant and how it um, is the symbol of the human soul in its relationship to the cosmos. So the last thing I want to say about the platonic solids, well, no, there are actually two things. One is that um, they have a relationship to the five elements, the four basic elements that we know plus ether, the element of ether. And so they represent the elements, these forms that we can see in, in solid form represent the elements of creation. And for us to delve into this in a deep way is very profound. So we have the cube, which is the symbol for the element of earth. And we have the isosahedron, which is the 20 faced triangle, triangle faced um, solid, which is the image for water. It's very fluid with all those various shapes. We have the octahedron, which has um, the four triangles pointing downward and the four triangles pointing upward that is the symbol for the element of air. We have the tetrahedron, which is the four-sided triangular figure with a triangle at the base and three triangles going up that is the symbol and image, the, the form of fire. And then we have the dodecahedron, which is 12-sided pentagrams, and that is the image of uh, ether, that is the form for the element of ether and the etherization of all of existence. 
So we'll go into this in greater detail when we come together. But the last thing that I just want to say about these platonic solids is that um, they have um, been understood to nest inside of one another. Uh, Kepler was able to, in his study of astronomy, which this, what I'm about to say, is a bridge between geometrica and astronomica, but that they can be nested inside of each other. You know, the way those Russian babushka dolls, you get a little one and you put it on the inside and bigger, bigger, bigger. Um, and, and the way that they nest has a relationship to do with the proportion of the um, orbital uh, space of each of the classical planets. And so when they're nested inside of each other, they are a picture of the cosmos and how the uh, dimensions and, and relationship of the orbits of the classical planets go. And so if, if we just, I'll just say what order they're in, and then we can take this um, further in the summer. So the, the largest one that's on the outside is the dodecahedron. And the next largest one that's inside of it is the isosahedron, the 20-faced uh, geometric form. And then after that is the octahedron, which is the eight-faced air form. And inside that is the hexahedron, the cube. And inside at the center is the tetrahedron, the fire element. And, and that's very interesting because if we also think of the earth, at the core of the earth, we have this um, fiery molten um, lava at the center of the earth. So these are ideas for us to think about and also to hold in context with what Jim said about the importance for us of grounding ourselves in the ultimate knowledge of existence and of the cosmos as a basis for our strength and capacity to meet the times that we are living in. So that's what I wished to share today. And now, Jim, I'd like to turn it over to you. Great, thank you, uh, Karen. <clears throat> and uh, uh, I wish you'd have had the actual platonic solids so that we could see them. Yes. Yeah, I'm that sorry would have been about very that. Helpful. Yeah, <laughs> we will in July. I was holding them up. <laughs> yeah, Ruth was trying to hold them up. Um, but uh, uh, I'd like in the a few minutes we've got left, uh, I'd like to make um, just a uh, couple of remarks. Um, first, just to recall that, you know, the genius of Pythagoras and the reason why he stands as such a giant uh, in the human journey uh, is because he was really the first one we know of, maybe along with the Buddha in the East, that actually understood that the universe is understandable. Think about that for a minute. Most people never think about that, even today. Most people just go through their lives and they go shopping and they have kids and they um, get married or they get sick and then they die and they have really very little sense of what's going on around them because they're not paying attention. Some great spiritual teachers uh, like Jesus, for example, 
don't know very much about what's going on, but they do know that you need to love one another. <laughs> that's, that's a key concept, right? That whatever is going on, you need to be loving one another and doing unto others as you would have them do to you. But then there's another layer, and in my view, a higher layer of consciousness that seeks to actually understand reality itself and allow reality itself to inform ethics. That was the achievement of the Buddha and his notion that emptiness is the cradle of compassion. And that was the transcendental genius of Pythagoras. And in fact, all four of the quadrivium, you know, musica, arithmetica, geometrica, and astronomica are all dedicated to Pythagoras or his disciples. And Pythagoras, as I said in Chartres last year, may be the most important human being ever to live. Because his mind penetrated so deeply into reality itself that he got to bedrocks. He understood that the universe was not only knowable, but it was rational. And it was rational because it was constructed with number, with sound, with music. Remember I told some stories about Pythagoras. He, was, he could hear the sounds of the planets. And it was Pythagoras that coined the term cosmos. Because he says, if you really understand what's going on, we're not in a static series of equations. We're in a poem. We're in a song that the universe is singing a song. We're part of a song. And cosmos means ornament. What is beginning to dawn on some physicists and cosmologists today, which I'd like to explore, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna seed this with Lawler in particular, is they're beginning to suspect that underneath number, is something even more fundamental. That in the end, all the platonic solids are a little too complicated. We couldn't quite track it when Karen was talking because we couldn't see it. Even when you see it, how they all fit together is really a complicated exercise. And an increasing number of physicists are saying that when we penetrate the deepest levels, it isn't gonna be about numbers at all. That the whole universe in the end is probably gonna rest on something so simple and so obvious that when we recognize it, it will be a shock because of its simplicity. So I just want you, everyone to entertain that thought. It's one of the things that I'm gonna uh, be thinking about uh, because it's, it's the cutting edge of physics and cosmology now. 
can we go beyond Pythagoras? And I want to read you a, a little poem by John Archibald Wheeler that is starting to get at where it's trying to go, this conversation about ultimate reality. He says, behind it all is surely an idea so simple, so beautiful, so compelling, that when in a decade or a century or even in a millennium, we grasp it, we will all say to one another, how could it have been otherwise? How could we have been so stupid <laughs> for so long? Think about that for a second. This is what Nassim Harriman, the physicist out in Hawaii is, is, is pushing up against. Is there something more fundamental to the universe than the platonic solids? That isn't mathematical at all. So I just want to see that thought in everybody's beautiful mind. and conclude with just the simple point that this pursuit, as I said at the beginning of this call, is crucial. The crazier it gets in the external world, the quieter you have to become in your interior, the more complicated and turbulent and hyper complex the superficialities become the more simple the more basic the more uncomplicated your psyche and soul need to be in order to grasp the simplicity at the heart of all the complexity. That's what Pythagoras taught us. And it may be our generation 2,500 years later that begins to penetrate beyond what he thought was ultimate reality. And it is that journey, that pathway, that is at the heart of the Chartres Academy. Because we are grounded not in the answers. We are grounded in the questions, not in truth possessed, but in truth pursued. And I want to uh, conclude by saying, even though we've been talking about Jane and, and, um, and Robert Lawler uh, as our, our faculty, I want to say that, that will, they will be balanced by um, three, two in the first instance, remarkable women, uh, Banafshe Syed and Peggy Rubin, that will be doing the morning practice and the uh, transformational art. So we're gonna have a balance each day uh, between Jane and, and Robert with Banafshe and Peggy, and I would add Ruth on the music. And then of course we have Karen and Carolyn and, uh, and Andrew that will be with us, Kaylin will be with us, Apila will be with us. So I just wanna end this call by just naming um, the faculty that really hold the container of the exploration that will be uh, Geometrica. And I know that brings us to the top of the hour.
I think we may have been a little bit loquacious uh, today, but I, I hope this is uh, 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 sufficient to uh, get us um, uh, motivated to, to really focus our calendars next year on being in Chartres for this very deep exploration around the bedrock of reality itself. Thank you, Jim. Um, Farnock just put in a little question that won't there be dream work? Yes, there will be dream work. Kapila will be there and yes, there will be dream work. Oh, definitely. We'll clarify that. <laughs> That's and, one, of the, one of the constants, Farnock. <laughs> yeah. And, and so, um, but we do have a few minutes if um, other people want to comment, either with questions or comments, anything, faculty, um, anybody who's on the call. Yeah, I put in the chat window, I put a link to one of those, uh, the sound forming shapes to a YouTube of that. Oh, thank you, Ruth. Yeah. Yeah, if you haven't seen those, those are just <laughs> remarkable. The way sound creates shapes out of sand or any kind of There's porous lots substance. Of YouTube, I just stuck one there so that people can take a look if they haven't seen it. So, so Ruth, how do we see that? Where did you put it? Yeah, I put it in the, in the chat. chat. In the chat. Okay, so everybody has to go to chat to see that. A link to one of them, and you know there are many of them, so you can check them out. It's quite okay. really worth taking a look at. It's pretty. Yes. Cool. Good. Thank you. And of course, that was the original insight of Pythagoras. It came through sound. He started with sound. Mm -hmm. Didn't start with numbers. He started with sound right. and figured out that the sound had certain uh, proportions uh, in the material world with the octave and so forth. So when you look at this little YouTube and you apply sound to sand and it gets a certain form, um, yeah. that's... It, it's much more complicated, I'm sure, in his lifetime, but that was the essence of the Pythagorean insight around musica, yeah. and then arithmetica, and then geometrica. And then his great insight is that that forms astronomica. That yeah. forms the totality of reality itself. And so that little YouTube is actually pretty profound. <laughs> the different vowel sounds, I don't know if this one has it, but the different vowel sounds like O, oh, ah, uh, they form completely different forms. Yeah, yes. Yeah. Different vowel sounds, which is yeah. talking yeah. a lot about, I mean, when you sing those vowel sounds, they're working with your body like that too. So yeah. it's pretty amazing. Yeah. Apila, are you saying something? next to me sorry <laughs> okay all right was there anyone else who wanted to share something dan does anybody have their hand up kaylin uh kaylin is anybody that's interested in more information about the sound part uh this is a book called cymatics by hans jenny which deals with sound and vibration on metal plates Aaron, we have myra jackson joining us yes wonderful Hello, everyone. I have a question, and it's not really a question that needs to be answered today. It's more of a kind of a point of, uh, of intervention, in a sense, <laughs> to this big conversation and the work ahead. You know, the whole idea around oral transmission to me is, is powerful because of experiencing it. But when we began talking about what might be underneath all the numbers, um, I get curious again about transmission. Lately, neurologists have been able to really look at the impact of the voice when we're speaking to others and the impact of the other on the voice. Uh, and Pythagoras himself, used this idea of oral transmission in the work. And I wonder if that's something that we can more deeply explore at Chartres uh, in the context of the, the work that's been laid out. It seems to me it's just an inkling or a kind of a hunch I have 
that it may be useful. The oral, um, what seems to be showing up in this neurological work where we find that people who are attentive and listening to the voice become synchronized through what we can see in heart rhythm and other ways, there's a certain bonding that occurs, uh, is clearly kind of pointing to what we understand of the, you know, the aliveness in the brain, the heart and the gut that has knowing. And so those are the pieces that I'm sort of putting into this quest of a question that I'm laying out. So I'm gonna close around those pieces that are not well spun, but that I offer to all of you. Thank you, Myra, that was beautiful. I, I share your, your question and how um, the effect of the voice of certain people, how that impacts us and well, I mean, and also, uh, Myra, uh, this is a perfect lead into Robert Lawler and his book, Voices of the First Day, right? And the Aboriginal uh, dream time and the way they would sing the dreams. So, I mean, you're, you're making an absolutely profound point, actually, in terms of, of this, um, the interactivity between sound and number and proportion uh, and, and music. I mean, the, uh, in all the anthropological research, you know, music in some ways preceded speech um, and, and dance and, and, and uh, art preceded prose. So I think you're onto something very profound and I would love to have Robert Lawler uh, comment on your uh, your observation and your question. So hold that thought for Chartres next year. I mean, it's a whole lecture. It's a whole it's a whole conversation. So thank you. Are there any further um, hands up, Dan? I'd like to offer um, oh, no one, well, I'd like to offer uh, a dream I had last year for uh, about the voice. Um, it was a, a series of nights that I felt a female presence with me that felt from my roots Persian. And one of the nights I was sweating all night and it was very, very, uh, very intense. And suddenly half awake, half asleep, um, she showed me that my um, vocal cords, and I'm shaking as I'm sharing it again, my vocal cords and I could see them. They were a form of like infinity loop, but not entirely. I, it wasn't an, it was two loops looping in each other and they were golden. And she showed me that once it was part of my heart. It was in my heart and it was fully connected. And then I saw a scene of a man coming from the back, ripping open my neck taking that golden cord out golden infinity loop and that was a horrible terror that came on me and I, I woke up sweating and I asked her in my dream sleep state who are you and she said Anahita and I looked her up and it's an ancient goddess from you know Persia anyway that that's a one of my big dreams and it it links into this oral um, transmission so that but to share that thank you Farnock good to see you Farnock even in the dark right. <laughs> you know she's come on as one of our PhD students since Chartres yes. good to see yeah. you Dan, is there anyone else? There are no hands raised at the moment. All right. Well, thank you for helping with this. And um, just want to thank everybody for being on the call with us. And thank you, Jim, for all that you had to say. And I'd like to invite Apila to give us a closing prayer.
Ancestors, this little light of our soul moving on the labyrinth, the still quiet electrifying presence of being in the center of the center. Let our voice emanate in accordance with the principles and reality of the first word of silence. We give thanks for being one with it. May the Shart community be an expression to the innermost source of that impulse put into motion so long ago and yet now. Amen. Thank you, Apila. Thank you, and many blessings to you until we meet again. I'd like to wish everyone a glorious holiday season, whatever you celebrate in your lives. Um, we're approaching, as we all know, the solstice and holidays from most traditions at this time of year. So just wishing everyone great joy and inner peace as we travel further into the darkness before we turn at the solstice toward the light again in the outer world. And may the light ever increase within us. So wish to say goodbye to everyone and look forward to seeing you again January, let's see if I can tell you, January 18th will be our next call. So very much look forward to being together again then and sending much love and blessings to all of you. Bye, everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you, Apila. Thank you, Ruth. Thank yes. you, Karen. Yes, thank you, Jim. Yeah. Bye. Thank you, everyone, for being in on the call. So good to be together again. <laughs> Happy yeah. holidays. On the run towards Shark 2018. Yay! <laughs> Yay.